Hello everyone and welcome back to all the mod 7 to the sky. So we built our mechanism fission reactor last episode. To go along with the reactor we also built out fissile fuel and perhaps foolishly decided to go for sodium cooling, which did involve building a few more thermal evaporation controllers. So we still have some work to do on the reactor today, mainly the safety switch, which isn't important right? That can wait. <laughs> we also have to look at the nuclear waste reprocessing into plutonium and polonium. The main reason we actually set up the reactor. But first of all today I want to do a bit of a progress check. How close are we to this ATM star? So there are 14 different unique items we need for this ATM star. Right now we only have two of them fully automated and that is the dragon souls which we can slot in right here. And once we add the recipe for the compressed nether star block, yeah it's going to be 2x compressed nether star. We make the nether stars from the weather simulations here, which means that we can also fill in these blocks and we can make more if we want more stars. I think the total number of stars we need is 12. That is the number we're going to aim for. So you're probably thinking, oh well, we have two items, we're nearly there. <laughs> uh, kind of. We've mostly been working on the recipes within the crafts here. So a lot of these were pretty close to being able to make. There's a few more items that we need to tick off our list though. The first one which should be nice and easy is the Patrick Star, just made with a whole bunch of dyed concrete. And again sure there is EMC for these guys but why not do it the fun way, we'll do it the create way. So it's a very similar system that we have here for making grey concrete, but this is a dedicated system. This new one here is meant to be able to wash any sort of concrete we want. It looks like for the Patrick Star we need magenta, pink, green and lime. Yeah so four, that should be pretty easy. So we have to set the recipe in 82, it's just gonna look like this. Concrete powder to regular concrete, lime, green, pink, and magenta. Those are going to go into this pattern provider. Oh, and I think we will need recipes for the powder as well. Powder is just made from sand and gravel. We're making both of these over here. And of course, we're making a lot of dyes over here at Batania. We also want to make sure there's a filter on the tunnel, just so that it doesn't let any of the concrete powder through without it being converted first by the fans. So the filter is going to contain all of the completed recipes. That's going to go on the tunnel. So yeah, the pattern provider will drop the concrete powder onto the belt, the fans convert it into regular concrete, the filter allows it through the brass tunnel, and then underneath the belt with the brass tunnel is a hopper connected to an interface. This is how we import the finished concrete back to our AE system. So now we should be able to request any sort of concrete, let's go for like a stack of pink. It should craft the powder, drop it onto the belt, in fact we can get rid of these trapdoors here. Yeah, so when it converts it should go back through this tunnel and go back into our AE system and mark the craft as completed. Let's clean up as we go. A good habit to get into. <laughs> There's still a lot of cleaning up around this base. I don't know when I'm going to find the time to do all of that. Alright, so that is the concrete taken care of. Now we need to make our Patrick star. And I did anticipate this recipe, which is the reason we have two sets of crafters here in the star shape. We have to somehow get an applied energistics connection over here and filter all of these crafters. it's working okay please tell me i got everything filtered is it gonna start the craft wait we're one short oh oh this is a disaster i ended up going with an xnet connector system and every single one of these mechanical crafters has its own unique filter since this recipe is only for the patrick star right and since i plugged the other side in we've now got all of these mechanical crafters oh which one is it here there has to be an easier way to do this but i couldn't think of one so i went with xnet and i'm regretting it now and to make matters worse, it's pink concrete that we're missing here. And what we have in the barrel is pink concrete powder, which means that one of these other ones is also off. Oh, okay, okay, I found it. Do you guys spot it? Do you see it up here? This is our culprit right here. This should be powder. Oh, it, it was simply unfiltered. That's what it was. That's why it let anything through. You may also notice on the side here that we have a create windmill. This is for stress unit generation, not something we've actually talked about much in the series. If you're not familiar with create, every device requires a certain amount of stress units. You can see here these mechanical crafters take 8 stress units. The way that we normally generate stress units with this electric motor, which turns RF into rotational force, is not enough for to run all of these crafters all at once connected to each other. It ends up overstressed. I'm not sure exactly why that is either because the max this thing can generate is 8000 stress units, whereas we're only generating 2048 with this windmill. If you guys know why that is, maybe I'm misreading something, uh, yeah let me know. 
Anyways, the windmill is a very easy fix. All you need is a windmill bearing, any block of your choice, and connect up some sails. Right click with an empty hand, that's going to spin it just with the power of the wind. Then we can just connect it all up to our crafters. Okay, now that we fixed the filter, let's try this a second time. Oh, I love these crafters. It looks good. I think it's going to start. It might just be very, very slow. I think we can speed it up with a rotational speed controller. Assuming we can actually make one of those things. You know what? I know how to speed it up. Who needs time in a bottle when you've got editing software? There it is. The first Patrick star. It should go to the drawer. Yep, there we go. And ending up in our AE system. Yes, awesome. We got the Patrick star, which goes right in the middle here. Well, it took a bit longer than I expected, but we should now have the ability with these windmills and everything connected to hook up the recipe for the ATM star as well. So the first major project for today is going to be dealing with these piglitch hearts. We farm these from the piglitches in the other dimension over here. The red dimension. This is way too red, like way too saturated. <laughs> Hello, Blitz. We have to use the piglitch hearts to make unobtainium aldamodium alloy. And this, as far as I can tell, can only be made in a tinker smeltery using unobtainium and aldamodium, which we then cast out onto the piglitch heart and that will give us one ingot. Nine ingots makes a block and 27 blocks makes the ATM star. So setting up this automation, we're going to have to get into some tinker's construct, which is a bit strange at this stage of the game. But for that, we need seared stone. I used our existing tinker smeltery to hook up inputs and outputs. And with the seared stone, we can use that to create a lot of these setups for unobtainium aldamodium. I have a feeling this is going to be a slow process. So while I was waiting on the seared stone, I began expanding our base once again for yet another automation setup. Alright, well, we have something in front of us. Whether it works or not, I have no clue. <laughs> We're about to find out, but we do need a special fuel for this. And this may also be the day that perhaps we give in to mystical agriculture. Obviously, we need a lot of unobtainium and all the modium. 2,916 to be exact, of each. And we only have 67 ingots of unobtainium. And I have played for many, many hours since we set this up. A lot of hours. Probably too many hours. But we kind of knew that was going to be the case, right? The bees are not productive at all. I mean, sure, we could squeeze out a little bit more productivity from them with the upgrades and whatnot. But you may notice, in order to smell any of these, we do need something called soul lava. How do we get the soul lava? Well, we have to come back here to infinite red land, and we're looking for a volcano. I know that I've spotted one last time I was here. I don't know where, though. Oh, I think this is it. I think this is what we're looking for right here. Uh, north, this way. Aha, this is the soul lava right here. There should be more than enough in this one volcano. I mean, I'm, I hope so. So all we need to do now is get this back to our base. And I'm thinking that we go with create for this. So there's something called a hose pulley. I think we can just connect this above. Give it some rotational power with the electric motor. And a flux point. Oh, it automatically goes the right way. Nice. Are we on a chunk boundary here? We are. Of course we are. Between four chunks. I couldn't have picked a better spot for this. I'm going to move this actually. Might as well also increase the speed on this thing. Wait, I have the right device here, right? Yeah, filling and draining. Yeah, this is definitely the right thing. Why are we not getting anything? Maybe it has to go into a pipe first. Turns out we need the mechanical create pump. We got another motor here just for simplicity and a cog wheel. Yeah, now we're getting the soul lava. Okay, let's chunk load this. That should have all connected to these ender tanks over here, which it did. We do actually have fluid in here. It's just a visual glitch, I believe. And can we just automatically output? Is that going to put it in the fuel tank? No tank in Okay, yeah, of course, we don't we don't even have a fuel tank on this thing. Let's fix that. That would help us out tremendously. Uh, this one, I think? Yeah, we need a few more seared stone. And actually, these should be tanks and not... Yeah, there we go. So that should have went into the fuel slot of the smeltery. So conveniently, each smeltery the size it currently is has nine input slots, which of course is one block. And then using XNet connectors, the alloy which is going to be created in the smeltery will have to set some filters here. That's going to be piped into each one of these casting tables, along with our piglet charts. That should solidify into the ingot we want, and that's going to go to this output drawer here. We just have to set the filters, of course. Yeah, so let's make this a drawer network and add a controller in. We'll have one drawer for the input of piglitch hearts, one drawer for all the modium, one drawer for an obtainium. We need to link all of these up to the controller. Yeah, so the inputs to the smeltery have to go inside seared shoots. We've got those on the bottom. 
We need to add another connector down here. Oh yeah, and we will need to do limited item fillers for each of these. Since we want the alloy, right, we don't want each smeltery to fill up with one ingot or the other. We can specify the maximum in destination inventory, but I'm not sure that's going to work for two different items. Okay, I don't actually think this is possible, what we want to do here. I tried a bunch of different options, but ultimately it ended up just throwing in on obtainium, which eventually is obviously going to clog the smeltery up, right? But I think I have a better idea. Aha, it works. Oh my goodness, I've had this place torn up. Yeah, laser IO seems to work here. Okay, man, I love this mod. It's, it's so good. We need to make sure it's on exact mode and enforced round robin. And just for good measure, we can also equip the input side to the smeltery inside the seared chute with a count and item filler, which only allows one of each item in here. I was trying like the alloyer and the seared melter, all sorts of things to get this to work, but I think this can work. Let me just clean up this area. All right, so after finally getting that set up to work, we needed a way to address our lack of unobtainium and aldemodium. And what you're about to see here is multiple hours of a huge rabbit hole, so bear with me. We start by making a few more Batania runes, and we need to fight the Guardian of Gaia. The runes allow us to craft the Mana Infuser, basically an upgraded terrestrial agglomeration plate, but instead of the Lapis and Living Rock, it's Gold and Shimmer Rock. The automation stays exactly the same. However, this does also increase the mana cost, so I added a bigger buffer for us. The Mana Infuser allows us to craft Alf Steel, and Alf Steel allows us to build the pylons to build the arena for the Guardian of Gaia fight. So what we want from this guy is one of his unique drops, which is the overgrowth seed. Not 100% guaranteed. And if you've ever fought the Guardian of Gaia, you know how tedious this is because of the second stage. After a certain HP threshold, he makes himself invulnerable, spawns a bunch of mobs, and it's it just extends the fight unnecessarily. But regardless, we were on a mission, so I fought him I don't know how many times. <laughs> Seven or eight, maybe? After getting the overgrowth seeds, we only got six, which is not ideal, but I'll take it. We also got the Ring of Odin, by the way, which increases our hearts. You guys remember this cow who was supposed to be for occultism? Well, we need his sewage. We're going to place him on top of an industrial forgoing sewer. We just have to give the sewer RF, and it's going to collect the sewage from the cow. The sewage we can pipe out of the machine into a tank. And we can place an applied energetic storage bus on there. Oh, why won't these pipes insert via the output slot? That's so frustrating. <laughs> I guess it's laser IO to the rescue again. Nothing beats this mod anymore. Except Ender IO. The sewage is then going to be sent into a sewage composter. We just request the fluid and the items from applied energistics and set it up next to the iridium enrichment chamber. And this will give us fertilizer. Alright, so the fertilizer we're going to come back to in a second. What we need to do here is quite risky, which is the reason why we're in a compact machine. This is a completely separate dimension to the overworld, and we're trapped inside this little box here. There's nothing that can break this. And I was really, really surprised when I seen the recipe for these things. Like, look, it's just compact machine walls and deep slate. Normally, there's that whole uh, crafting mechanic. I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Anyways, we're here. We can get our personal shrinking device, which is what allows us to teleport here. This is also going to be our getaway if things go south. And this is tinted glass, which is just some glass and coal. It's so much cheaper than the mystical agriculture alternative. Apparently, it's weatherproof. I don't trust it for being so cheap, but I mean, that's the reason why we're in the compact machine, just for safety, right? So one of the other things we need in this quest is ether gas. Ether gas is made with the laser drill, similar to the way we collected iridium, only this one is for our fluid collection. And the laser drill we have to place over a wither. We have to also put the laser drills around it, but we'll wait until the wither is in place first. And we want to keep him in place, right? So we've got the stasis chamber. If we give this thing power and we put it underneath the wither, it's supposed to tame him. Actually, maybe we can place this underneath a block. It's so hard to see because of all those connected textures. But yeah, I think this might work if we power this up before we spawn him. And then we spawn him in right, like right here. Oh yeah, you can see it gives us like slowness, extreme slowness when we're in the range. So it's good to know that it does actually affect up here. All right, what's the worst that can happen here? He's in. Oh, I can't place a block above him. Oh, that's not good. Oh, and it froze him in the in the spawn animation. Yeah, we're not getting a mob bar here. I think we have to spawn him in for this to work. Hmm, this might not work the way it is. 
Let's try it out. Let's play some lasers and see if we get any ether gas from this. Oh, you know what? We forgot one little thing, the laser lens, which is required in this thing. And there's no blacklisted biomes, so I hope that it does actually work in the compact machine. Okay, with a lens in there, is it going to work? Oh, oh, nice, it does work. Awesome, let's get some more laser drills, speed this up, give them all upgrades. We'll make sure that we use all the space here. Awesome, so now we got all the laser drills in place, we got speed and efficiency in all of them. It looks like this is pretty fast, I don't think we're going to need any faster than this. Although, of course, we could add more laser drills if we wanted to. Maybe it means we have to break this part here, but... It should be fast enough. Anyways, we're going to place this into some ender tanks. We can specify the output as push to the top, and they should be able to just go on top here. Now we just have to chunk load this dimension. I wasn't really sure where to put this compact machine, but it's it's here now. Uh, look at this, this is so cool. It gives you like a little preview of what's inside. Minus the wither. It doesn't actually show mobs, I guess. So yeah, this is the day we give into mystical agriculture. I think we have to use the tools available for us, right? Don't be mad at me. <laughs> We had fun along the way, it's the journey that counts, not the destination. Anyways, the reason for the ether gas and the fertilizer is because we're not going to be using the same method of farming that we have here. It technically could work. Oh, come on, you guys again. I know there is the charm, by the way, I know the charm exists. <laughs> I just keep cleaning out my inventory and it goes away and then I forget about it again. And then those guys return like five minutes later. I wanted to try out hydroponic beds, which seemingly are going to be faster than what we have here. At least considering we, we can't make as many seeds because they're way more expensive than these ones here. Which means that we wouldn't have enough to saturate the plant sores and it would be much slower at replanting the seeds. With this one, we don't ever have to replant so long as we give this ether gas. I think it's going to be much more simple like this with a single seed setup. Seriously. <laughs> Come on. So we have to craft up the seeds here using the infusion altar. This is actually the first time I'm ever using this thing, but we have to give this a redstone signal, seed base in the middle, and then it's going to be four Aldemodium blocks, and it should start, yeah, there we go. All right, there's the first Aldemodium seed. We can also craft up the Unobtainium, which, by the way, we can actually only get one of, unfortunately. All right, so we got the first two starting seeds. This should be a pretty simple setup, all things considered. No way. See, I'm, I'm not lying. There's something... There's something suspicious going on here. <laughs> so just behind our existing farm, I've set up 12 hydroponic beds. We have plenty of space here to expand as we need to. We have a laser node on each one. We're going to give this a fluid card. A fluid card which will import fluids to all the hydroponic beds. That's extracting from the ender tank we set up. And this is also on round robin. Yeah, so they now all have ether gas inside. We have to distribute energy, which we could do with laser IO. I think we're just for simplicity, we're going to put some flux points here. Whenever these things harvest a seed, they will put it in the output slot. It doesn't drop it on the ground, so this is much more lag friendly. I just heard another one. We can have another item card inside the laser, which is on extract. And that's going to go into the ender chest. We want an insertion card here. Same for them all. There is one more thing we need to get this to work, and that is magical soil. All of the top tier seeds, I believe, require this thing. And this is where the overgrowth seed comes in. We need overgrowth seeds, we need Gaia Spirit ingots, which also take Terra Steel. That might take a minute to craft. And we also need blocks of Insanium. Fortunately, we still have over 9,000. Yeah, 9,000 Insanium Essence. We're, we're good on Insanium. Anyways, this should give us magical soil. Nice. I think you also need this if you plant it in world as well. Not necessarily just for the hydroponic beds. So yeah, we put this underneath, then we can plant our seeds on top. And the last thing is actually water. There's two fluid inputs, I forgot about this. We'll place a sink below this laser, and that way we can also use laser IO to distribute the fluid. We already have the fluid cards in there, so all we need to do is set this to extract and round robin. Is it going to harvest? Ah, nice. I think we just need some speed upgrades in here. The industrials foregoing speed add-ons. And it should all be going to the chest, right? Excellent, nice. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're out of sugar. Uh, it turns out the sugar cane that we had at the start of the series did not carry us. We used them all for conveyors the other day. All right, just how fast can we make this? I added in some lily pads of fertility to increase the growth rate. It does seem to make a difference here, I think. It's definitely faster than what it was, but it's, I think that's just because of the speed and efficiency upgrades in here. I want to also try growth accelerators which can stack up to 64 below the plant. Yeah, does this make any difference? It kind of looks the same to me, right? <laughs> I don't know. To fix the sugar problem, I added in a phytogenic insulator. Not very fast, but it doesn't need to be. It's fully passive. And I also added in a handful of crafters here. 
We're just basically filtering from the ender chest. Again, using Laser IO, the best mod in the world. Definitely the my favorite mod of this pack so far. And yeah, this just crafts it into the nuggets, which we're going to store in a compacting drawer. Next one here is for Unobtainium Essence. We can also just set a recipe here. Oh yeah, look at that. That's like a day's worth of bee production right there. <laughs> yeah, it looks like we get one every sec, maybe every two seconds, every three seconds. It's really hard to tell. We also get something called Fertilized Essence. It's basically just used for bone meal, but we're just going to avoid the excess in this drawer here. Alright, so we should probably add more seeds as we get more essence. And the seeds will allow us to fuel this smeltery system here. So I decided to make it one big smeltery. No real reason to split it up. As I mentioned before, we got the input drawers for all the modium and unobtainium. We're just going to fill this manually so that we don't waste it. Along with the piglet hearts. That's going to get melted and alloyed here. And it should be pulled into this casting table. Did I not set? I thought I had this working. Oops, forgot to put the flux point here. I heard it. Yeah, now it's working. Okay. Yeah, this is going to give us the blocks we, or the ingots that we need. Honestly, it probably would have been faster just doing all of this manually. But manually really isn't the name of the game in modded Minecraft, right? So on that note, we're going to come back to our fission reactor here. We got it running last episode, but not very efficiently, and we were only burning 0.1 millibuckets per tick. So I think it's time that we try to increase that. You know, working with these reactors makes me quite uneasy. <laughs> I'm a little nervous right now. But I believe I've installed a few more systems which should make it more safe to operate. We are in the middle of our second test right now. The first one get, didn't quite go to plan. We're currently at 11 burn rate, so we're burning more than 10 times what we were last episode. Due to the fact that we're pushing the burn rate quite a bit, I've upgraded all of these machines. So we're now making more fissile fuel. Oh, but I left out the poor enrichment chambers. Yeah, these, these are going to need to... After the first fail of a test, I kind of wish I recorded it, but it, it didn't happen. Basically, the sodium hit levels got to here, and I, I, I panicked. I panicked so hard. <laughs> but I boiled it down to the fact that we were using quantum entangler porters. I have since switched those out with regular pipes. I believe the transfer rate on the quantum entangler porters wasn't enough to transfer the amount of superheated sodium we were getting, and therefore wasn't able to be properly recycled. So yeah, the two pipes on this side are to export the sodium back into the reactor as coolant, and the ones on this side go from the reactor into the boilers. The only place we still use quantum entangle porters is to input the fuel, but we shouldn't hit the transfer rate on the entangle porter for burn rate, at least not yet. So yeah, the extra safety measures that we've taken here, we've got two logic adapters on this side of the reactor. These are pretty cool, they actually allow you to configure based on a number of parameters. This one here though is set to high temperature which outputs a redstone signal when the reactor reaches dangerous temperatures. I'm not sure exactly what that is, what the threshold would be to be considered dangerous. But when that happens, it activates the redstone dust, goes through a pulse repeater. A pulse repeater is basically just a monostable circuit. It will basically just one tick pulse this redstone dust. That's going to hit the second logic adapter, and this is on activation. The activation mode will change the state of the reactor, whatever it's in, whenever this redstone dust changes from 1 to 0. So basically, if it's on, it turns off. If it's off, it turns on. But we don't want it to stay on, right? Which is why we need to one tick pulse this. Just for demonstration, if we power this, it only sends one tick. We don't want the reactor to stay on whenever this is receiving high temperature. I hope that makes sense. Anyways, we also have a second detection in the form of this redstone link. This is the receiving end, and the sender end is on this chemical tank right here. This measures our level of fissile fuel. So before we send it into the entangle porter to be sent to the reactor, we first of all buffer it in an extra chemical tank. It looks like it is now full, which is a good sign, although, although the reactor is off right now. But yeah, what we're doing here is we're making sure there is something in this chemical tank with the use of the comparator, inverting the signal and then sending that to the redstone link. That will also send the one tick pulse to the reactor and turn it off if it's on and on if it's off. I can do a quick demonstration here. I have this note block. If we hook this up to the same redstone dust, which will be powered when this receives, we'll stick some repeaters down. So we should hear this sound. We can simulate us being out of fissile fuel by just breaking this. It's effectively like we're emptying the tank. You can hear the sound go off. That means that it activated this logic adapter. 
and that is just basically a check to make sure that we have fuel to sustain a reaction. Oh yeah, I feel like it is po worth pointing out here. I know there is insufficient fuel down here. You can measure it straight off the reactor, but I want to measure it slightly further back in the chain. But I guess that could have worked as well with the logic adapter. And the third safety measure we have up here is also for high temperature. We have a third logic adapter here, which apparently is unset. <laughs> this should be high temperature. Whenever we have the high temperature, it's going to unpower this torch. And as you can see, the pressurized tubes connect to the interface and the input ports of the reactor. And this should feed it a quick injection of sodium. So basically, it gives the reactor an extra burst of coolant, hopefully enough to cool it off before it explodes. As, yeah, whenever you turn this thing off, it doesn't instantly cool down. As you can see here, it's quite, it's quite slow, even with full coolant. There's one tiny change I want to make to this. Because Applied Energistics can only send so much sodium at once, we want to make sure there's a big enough buffer to actually give the reactor, right? I mean, you saw how much it took last episode to actually fill this thing. So we're going to have three chemical tanks worth of sodium buffer. And that we can feed from the interface here. Yeah, these we can have on all the time. And yeah, these are on redstone sensitivity on. You just have to click with the configurator. That was pretty in-depth. I hope that made sense. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. And I hope it works as well. Although with the tests, I think I'm pretty sure it works. I've done some testing in creative mode as well. Anyways, the final thing for today is going to be hand to handle this nuclear waste. We have built up quite a bit here. It's time to start looking at some processing. The first thing that we have to do for this process is make a solar neutron activator. I didn't realize this took HDPE though. Oh man. <laughs> okay, we're gonna have to get into oxygen product. We, we should have oxygen spare. Ethylene is made from biofuel, right? Yeah. Yeah, water, hydrogen, biofuel. And biofuel is basically any plant material. <laughs> well then, uh, where are we gonna put this process? Good question. I was not accounting for this at all. I think I might have broken one of my main design principles when building a base. I get a lot of people asking me like, three, where do you come up with your ideas? Like, how do you design stuff like this? Honestly, it's just mostly building for what you need and a lot of trial and error. But one of the main rules I like to follow is don't build yourself into a corner. And by that, I mean, always have room and space to expand. And just walking and flying around here, we don't really have that much. We have to be able to connect to applied energistics and there's not many places that fit the criteria very well. Alright, alright, found it. <laughs> HDPE, that's gonna go into a drawer. So I chose to go for wheat seeds. We farm the wheat seeds with our create farms. I've actually turned it off for quite a while. Oh, I like that grass color over there. Is that default? Is this default mushroom field grass color? I don't know. But yeah, the crusher crushes it into biofuel. That's passed along to the pressurized reaction chamber. We pull hydrogen from our AE system from this interface, along with water. Today I learned that you can't actually pull from sinks with laser IO. But apparently you can pull from the interface with laser IO for the fluids. So we give it energy and the fluids with the lasers. The hydrogen comes on this pressurized tube. That all mixes together for substrate and ethylene. The ethylene we buffer in this chemical tank. The substrate is buffered in the drawer below. Although we should remember to lock this drawer. The drawer and the chemical tank both have storage buses on there, which allows us to send it across the room over here. The gaseous ethylene plus more water plus the substrate gives us more substrate. We actually turn one into eight and get some of our oxygen back. The oxygen is then used in another pressurized reaction chamber. And this plus liquid ethylene. We use the condensator here to turn gas into liquid. And the liquid ethylene is then combined here to give us HDPE. We're using lasers for most things, but these interfaces are here just to pull the gases. I really wish it was possible to use gases with lasers. We might as well give everything speed upgrades. I noticed also while I was building it that we actually need this for next episode as well. There's a few other reactor processes which do require this HDPE, not just the solar neutron activator. But I think unfortunately we're going to have to wrap up the episode here. This episode came in really quick for me. <laughs> Sometimes I play this game for like the whole afternoon I end up with like three minutes of video. Today though is the opposite, like I've cut out so many hours today and still we've ended up with 30 minutes. It's crazy. So yeah, I think we save the nuclear waste processing for next episode. It might also be worth adding a detection for overflow. I'm not exactly sure what happens when you back up on nuclear waste. I can't imagine it's anything good. I know that was pretty quick with the HDPE production. If you're interested in any of the specifics or anything else we've built this episode, I'm going to leave a world download available in Discord if you, if you want to check that out. But yeah, that is going to do us for this episode. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next episode. <laughs>